Greetings and welcome to chapter 16. Um, let's see if you can remember uh, what we learned on the first uh, week of class with the four functions of management. The four functions are plan, organize, lead, and control. So uh, appropriately, chapter 16 is our very last function of management, very important function about control. And think about these closed loops uh, that we've talked about in other chapters. Uh, planning is one thing, organizing is another thing, leading, uh, but you, you close, you need to have all four functions together coherently uh, to make sure that uh, you are able to manage well. So let's get started. Uh, I will, uh, I've, I've tweaked some things in this chapter a little bit, but otherwise I am following the book. Um, uh, this chapter is on page 352. As always, I recommend that you follow along. Sorry, I'm going to drink a little coffee right now. All right, so uh, let's look at the content of this chapter for learning outcomes. We'll look at the basic control process, uh, discuss the various methods that manager can use to maintain control, describe the behavior, processes, and outcomes uh, that today's managers are choosing to control in their organization. Um, the first thing is, uh, again, you know, I, I always encourage you to make sure you read uh, any type of vignette or opening pieces. And this one was quite interesting. It's about quality bicycle products over here on page 352 and how they installed um, energy efficient lights emitting uh, the LED lights uh, for a 122,000 square foot distribution center. Uh, the LED lights, as we know, are two to three times more expensive to install than regular fluorescent lights, but uh, they're 90% more efficient and can last up to 25 years. Now keep in mind that in this 122,000 square foot distribution facilities, the cost of fluorescent lighting was nine to $10 per square meter every year. So multiply that by 600,000 square foot facility uh, and you have a half a million dollars worth of cost each year with the fluorescent lights. Um, Quality Bicycle also outfitted LED lights with motion sensors uh, that only activate the lights when someone's present and daylight sensors that reduce lighting when natural light is present. Uh, the company said to have uh, paid this off, this investment off in a year and a half. Um, so again, you know, just a nice little way to opening uh, how you can control your cost in this particular case. So control is a regulatory process of establishing standards. So notice what I highlighted here. Number one, establish standards to achieve your goals. Number two, you compare your actual performance against the standard. And number three, you take corrective action when necessary. I've referred to this before in class as a closed loop, right? How you have a goal and you do the thing and uh, then when you're done with the thing, uh, you compare uh, the outcome to what you had established as a goal and see if the outcome was you had what, what you had established. If it's not, you make improvement and the second time around, you do it again. And this is a, a closed loop, the, it's called the PDCA cycle or the Deming cycle, the Schuard cycle. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So that's for control over here. Uh, standard is the basis of comparison for measuring the extent to which various kinds of organizational performance are satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Um, and so the standard becomes a really important. We'll learn about something, uh, actually I think we've talked about it before, but we'll learn more about benchmarking and how you properly benchmark and establishing your standard uh, and how what procedure you're going to come up with to establish the standard is going to be really important as a trajectory to, to see what kind of uh, quality you get with your output. All right. Let's look at setting the standards. So standards are determined by ensuring whether uh, they enable goal uh, goal achievement. Again, uh, following along with your book, there's some really neat stuff here from your author. Um, I liked on page uh, 354 um, how your author discusses um, the, the the launch 
of the new smart cards, right? So the credit cards that we all probably by now all have them with a little chip there. Um, and, um, you know, the reason, if you think about the standards that the credit card company had, and we're learning this in this chapter here, was initially, of course, uh, they were, were measuring everything by convenience, right? Credit card, very convenient way to shop. Everybody's got them. Um, but then that got replaced because of fraud, and uh, it went from convenience to security and safety. Merchants, however, uh, you know, businesses uh, where you go in to buy stuff, merchants, uh, were not thrilled about the change because it meant that they had to invest in new systems, right? They had to invest in new machines. And so in order to ensure that everybody, uh, you know, all the merchants were playing along, uh, the credit card industry uh, said, look, if you, if you refuse to use a new machine and you insist on having your clients swipe the old fashioned way, uh, then you will incur cost for fraud, not us. Um, sure enough, uh, people were, you know, again, you know, the, the, the whole issue of the chip was, was not uh, fun, right? You um, swipe the card, you get scolded by a cashier to use the chip reader, you insert the chip and cancel all foreseeable plans. You wait, you wait some more, you celebrate once you hear the joyless remove card sound. Uh, this is a little excerpt from your book. Uh, of course, so it, you know, the, the, that took 13 seconds to approve a payment, right? Uh, what we found out later on, of course, if for those of us who have Apple Pay uh, or Android Pay, uh, now uh, on the same machines is six seconds or less. And of course, uh, ironclad in terms of security. So um, just a nice way of kind of embarking into this, this uh, notion of uh, setting standards for the credit card company. Uh, just remember what we learned in planning. The best plans have to be flexible and adaptable to change, right? And so that's a good example of this credit card company or credit card industry had to modify their plans, right? To go from convenience to security. Uh, there we go. So, you know, this is what I just talked about. Credit card companies change the standard from convenience to security due to financial loss. All right. Listen to your customer feedback is another one. Uh, always make sure that, uh, you know, you, you um, uh, and that, that kind of, again, the example of the credit card companies. When a customer is giving you feedback, just remember this. They're doing you a favor. It's really important. They're not they're not being annoying, uh, they're not nagging, they're doing you a favor because you have to remember, and we'll see what the numbers are later on, they're astonishing. Most customers will not complain directly to the company. They will just take their businesses, their business elsewhere. So that's why you have to remember that when someone gives you feedback, uh, they're, they're, they're doing you a favor. And act on that. Sometimes what you believe are your own processes and control that determine quality and value are not the same in the eyes of your customer. Um, I'll give you an old example. Uh, Intel, back in the 90s, uh, introduced a new chip. And a math teacher with way too much time on his hand uh, discovered that there was a floating point unit error uh, beyond, I think it was like six decimal points beyond, beyond. And um, sure enough, it made some local news, but Intel responded by saying, look, nobody's gonna calculate that far beyond the decimal point, nobody cares, our chip is fine, you're gonna be fine. But the thing got traction. And even though people, of course, it's true, they were never gonna you know, calculate anything beyond that, that decimal point that far, um, it was still the perception that the product was defective and it could affect things, you know, their, their banking or whatever. And uh, Intel kept saying, no, we understand this better than you do. Uh, we're fine with our standards and the chip is fine. And it wasn't until uh, about three or four months later when Intel started really losing market share to AMD uh, that it finally uh, said, okay, tell you what, bring your computers into, uh, back then, retailers uh, that sold uh, uh, computers and we'll pay for the cost of having the chip uh, upgraded. And they even had a patch, actually, I think software patch, 
Well, it turned out the majority of people didn't even bother bringing their laptops in. They just wanted to be told that there's a solution uh, so that it, they, they could feel more confident in the product. So again, remember that it's not always what you think as a company uh, that matters when it comes to the perception of reliability and quality. All right, then we're getting into benchmarking. Uh, benchmarking, I kind of added this. I think it's always a fun kind of to, to, to look at a word and look at the etymology of the word. Why is it called benchmarking, right? Derives from shoe cobblers. Uh, when fitting a person for a new pair of shoes, the cobbler would ask the patron to place their foot on a bench in order for the cobbler to make a mark to fit the person, uh, uh, to, to make sure that uh, they, they properly fit their shoes. So that's where the term benchmarking comes from. It's a comparison, isn't it? And so let's look at, let's look at the definition here. Uh, it involves identifying a company against which to benchmark those standards and collect data to determine performance standards of other companies. Um, companies that benchmark uh, created, uh, a, a, and this is a study that, uh, from your, from your uh, book, created a competitive environment promoting improvement and growth, reduced department budget by 3%, improved caseload by 10%, and reduced wait time by 350%. Uh, benchmarking is really important. However, a little caveat from our old friend, Dr. W.E. Deming, uh, the father of uh, quality as we know it today, modern quality movement, uh, TQM, etc. He used to say that when you benchmark, the worst thing that could happen to you is to have a lousy competitor. I mean, think about that for a second. If you are, in fact, this happened in the, in the 80s, GM, Ford, Chrysler, uh, famously used to benchmark against each other, never even listen to their customers. Uh, and so if you had one new you know, innovation coming out from one of the companies, uh, then all they cared about was to beat that innovation. And it wasn't until the 90s when Toyota uh, released uh, the new uh, brand Lexus uh, that the first year, uh, sorry, the second year, Lexus broke record in uh, patents and copyrights. And the reason they have broken records is because instead of benchmarking to other automakers, they spend billions of money getting feedback from people who had bought their car the first year. They wanted to know what's working, what's not working. And a lot of the innovations and inventions actually that they came up with came from uh, customers. So again, think about you know benchmarking being problematic because uh, if you're all you're doing is uh, measuring against yourself a couple of local competitors, then that's that's that could be a problem for you. Um, all right, let's let's move on to now benchmarking. Uh, if we go a little bit beyond the book, which I took the liberty of doing because this is such a fascinating topic. So number one, be careful of benchmarking. You got to make sure you benchmark against you know. Um, the best in this case in the industry, not just your closest competitor. Um, you know, at Chafee College, sometimes if we want to see, like, uh, you know, how's our website, how's our portal, there's a tendency for a lot of people to say, well, Mount Sac has this, Citrus has this, just local colleges. There's over, there's almost a thousand community colleges in the United States. It's fascinating for me to see how few people expand the horizons to say, well, is there a ranking for the top four, top five by companies that rank websites to see maybe, um, you know, how, how we could benchmark our website uh, on, on the top five and make sure that we always involve you, the student, for your feedback. Um, so having said that, you can also go beyond your own industry. Um, you know, uh, Toyota, for example. Toyota is a pioneer in quality and reliability. I know we've talked about it in this class. What's fascinating is that uh, Toyota has its own university, Toyota Universities for employees to learn about the Toyota, uh, Toyota way. Um, the TPS is, is, is what it's called, Toyota Production Systems. But what's fascinating is that the people who attend Toyota University more and more are from outside uh, institutions. Um, I remember being involved uh, back in the early 2000 uh, in, in various uh, aspects of uh, Toyota University and attendees uh, 
at some of these events were from uh, financial institutions. You know, think about that. Big banks were sending uh, their managers to learn the Toyota way. So sometimes benchmarking, uh, if you're smart, will go beyond your own industry. And so here's an example of that uh, that uh, I picked up here uh, that I thought I wanted, you know, you, you would find interesting. Ever go to the store and wind up in a long checkout line with only two open registers? Well, Kroger's trying to fix that. John Matteris is on your side with the high-tech chain so you don't waste your time or your money, John. On register lines, so Kroger is adding another high-tech touch to your routine shopping trip. We told you recently about the scan and go test program in some Kroger's where you scan your items as you shop. So everything is tallied up by the time you get to the checkout counter. Well, now there is another program, infrared cameras. Kroger tells none on your side that these infrared cameras, which detect body heat, can now track and monitor customers waiting to check out. It then determines how many registers need to be open. The cameras are going into 95% of its stores they're already in many of the tri-state Kroger stores, and the company says they're working. The average wait time, down to 26 seconds in line. Three years ago, shoppers waited about four minutes to see a cashier. Kroger has said it's also opened up 2,000 more express lanes because of what it learned from those infrared cameras. So very interesting right there, right? I mean, going from four minutes to about 25 seconds. And so what's fascinating about that example is, again, where did that uh, benchmark come from? Well, they're using technology from the Department of Defense. Uh, this is military technology that is now used commercially. So again, just, just always, always go beyond, you know, as they say, think outside the box, right? All right, so now we're getting into uh, comparison to standards and corrective action. We're on page 355. So comparison to standards, uh, the quality of comparison between your actual performance and actual standard depends on the company's measurement and information systems. So again, sometimes there's going to be restrictions. Sometimes things are going to be limited. Um, and so you want to make sure that uh, you understand how you're told to gauge and make sure that uh, you act accordingly based on uh, what the company is giving you. Corrective action involves identifying performance deviation, analyzing those deviations, and developing and implementing programs uh, to correct them. So I, I go back to that closed loop, right? It never ever uh, changes. Uh, later on, we'll you know I'll use you as an example, as a students, right? Where we're looking at um, you, you want to ace the class. And that's your goal. When I'm sure all of you, uh, when you take a class, you you already know I want to get an A in this class. Um, and by the way, some of you are not sure. Like I don't know if I want an A. I just want to pass it. I don't care. You have no idea what life has in store for you in the future. You don't know. Um, I will share this with you. Uh, I was uh, I, I taught part time at Cal Poly for 11 years. Uh, until I started full-time at Chafee, and I remember um, students coming back and um, uh, asking for advice because they were not able to get into graduate schools, uh, well, in accredited programs, AACSB accredited programs, uh, and they were not able to get in because their GPA sucked. So they had just gotten, you know, A's, B's, and C's, and they had graduated, uh, they got their diploma, they got a bachelor's of science in business administration, emphasis in something. And a couple years later, three, four, five years later, they're, they're doing great at work. Their boss is super happy, but they got to go back and get an MBA. And uh, their GPA was low enough that they have to score ridiculously high on the GMAT score, so much so that they didn't think it was feasible or they would try two, three times and give up. And so, you know, just... Because you don't know what the future has in store for you, and we're talking about uh, control over here, uh, err on the side of caution and uh, go for A's and B's, right? Maintain and protect your GPA. If you're not doing well in the class, consider dropping it when you still can and retake it later on. Um, 
you uh, you 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 might you might find out the hard way later on that your GPA did matter. Um, all right. So anyway, um, having said all that, uh, those are closed loops, right? Uh, plan. Uh, it's the it's a PDCA cycle, right? Plan, do, check, act that we talked a little bit about before. Uh, let's talk about Florence Nightingale, fascinating, fascinating woman, a pioneer of hand washing and hygiene for health. So. Uh, she. This is what she said in 1860, right? Every nurse ought to be careful to wash her hands very frequently during the day. Uh, and if her face too, so much the better. Now, that is huge. Why? Uh, I want you to think about uh, where we are today for a second. 5% uh, of hospital patients catch an infection at the hospital. I mean, uh, uh, that's too much, right? And it sounds like maybe who cares? It's an well. It costs the average the it cost an average of fifteen thousand dollars per incident to treat such infections. One hundred thousand patients die each year from hospital infections, and the healthcare workers wash their hands about half the time. This is all on page three fifty five of your book. And so in the example for your book, corrective action is uh, one example is this hospital had an electronic monitoring hand hygiene system that tripled the rate of hand washing. What's fascinating to me is if you, if you read up on Florence Nightingale, she is such a phenomenal person, a figure in history. Uh, she was this woman who uh, you know, kind of figured out uh, that in battles, uh, soldiers, if, if, if doctors and nurses wash their hands, uh, she actually kept data and calculated that there were less uh, deaths caused by infection just by washing hands. And um, uh, she faced a tremendous amount of opposition uh, from the you know, uh, medical organizations and leaders in, 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 in the UK thinking that she was just nuts and just, you know, do your job. And it wasn't until much later that uh, she was credited actually for being the person, you know, all these campaigns here during COVID, wash your hands, wash your hands. Uh, you can thank uh, Florence uh, Nightingale for being the first one to figure that one out. Anyway, um, that was my public announcement for the day. Actually, there might be more. Stay tuned. Uh, so anyway, interesting stuff, right? I think. Uh, let's get into the now uh, dynamic cybernetic process. We're still on 355. We're toward the bottom of 355 here. And so first on the right, this is what we have from our author on uh, 355, 356, right? So you set the standard, you measure your performance, you compare your performance with the standard, you identify any deviation. Uh, deviation, we also call them performance gaps, right? You after you've identified them, you analyze them, and then you develop and implement a program for corrective action, and you put that back into measuring your performance. And the loop here is an infinite loop, right? Um, so what I did here, this is not in the book, but what I did is I, I added that on the left. This is the Deming wheel, the PDCA cycle, plan, do, check, act. And basically the reason I did this is because really Deming gets all the credit on that one. Uh, well, Deming and Schuart. Uh, where he devised this thing, which is what we call the continuous improvement wheel. If, you know, when your kids one day ask you, mommy, daddy, what is continuous improvement? You can explain to them, oh, honey, that's the plan, do, check, act wheel developed by Deming and Schuart uh, that never, ever ends. Um, have a good life. So you plan what it is you're going to do. Then you do the thing. Then you check. And then you act based on what you found when you were checking. And then you put that in the plan and you do it again. And you never, ever, ever stop that. So just think, Dr. Deming taught that uh, and many, many other things to Toyota. Uh, and Toyota still very much uh, uses all of this today, never wavered. And so that wheel really is kind of at the heart of that cybernetic control process. Uh, you know, if you look at the 1972 over here, uh, Deming uh, was already playing around with the PDCA cycle uh, in the 30s and 40s, so there's nothing new. It's just kind of a repackaged, I think, of the PDCA cycle. All right, so that's a cybernetic control process. Um, so now that we've got that out of the way, let's go on with the basic control uh, mechanisms. These will pop up again. Uh, you know, most of you, of course, are business majors, so you'll 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 learn more about this in the future in grad school, etc. So the most common type of uh, 
control mechanism is the feedback control, right? So it's the one that happens after the fact, right? So feedback control, gather information about performance deficiencies after they occur and use the same information to correct or prevent performance deficiencies. This is where you guys have to be proactive. I, I, I use you as an example as students, right? Um, my, you know, myself and my colleagues, uh, just think about you you have worked on some big assignment, right? And you turn it in, it's a midterm and it's 12 pages. And you're going to have another one at the final, by the way. So you have a big midterm assignment, it's written, it's 12 pages, and you're going to have another 12 pager at the end of the semester. And your instructor takes the time to make marks and recommendations and... Uh, you know, spend their <laughs> spring break doing that. And you get it back and all you care about is like, oh crap, I got to see, I got to do better. And you just file it, right? Well, that's a mistake because you're not taking advantage of the feedback control, right? So what you really need to do is you need to summarize what you did wrong. Make sure that you improve that because you might do it again. Maybe you put the commas in the wrong place if it's an English class or, you know, um, if it's, uh, I don't know, business law, you, you, you were wrong in the way that uh, you uh, identified uh, some of the rules of law. Anyway, you get the idea. It's critical that you do your part to improve upon the things uh, where you have had those performance, ba performance gaps. So the feedback control, it's already done. You can't change the grade, but it really have to make it count for the future. All right. Then what about concurrent control? Uh, you gather information about performance deficiencies as they occur. You eliminate or shorten the delay between performance and feedback. This, an example of that is beta testing, right? Uh, this is how software manufacturers do it. In, in our case, for class here, uh, I thought, you know, some of you have, have uh, done this, but if you contact the career center, I'm sorry, uh, the success center, uh, we have all these workshops on uh, test taking strategies, right? Um, and so, some students, uh, you know, multiple choice, uh, you, you should really, really consider if you have never taken those workshops, take a workshop on test taking strategies. Um, if you're smart about it and if you understand how it works, you will increase your score in just about every exam, about 5 to 10 percent. That's a whole letter grade just by virtue of understanding uh, you know, how to, you know, what are the, some of the basic rules of taking a test? So that would be concurrent control. In the auto industry, if we use Toyota as an example, uh, you know, their competitors uh, back in the 80s, maybe they were dropping a transmission inside of the car, and then uh, the car rolls off the assembly line, and then they realize, oh, dang it, it's, there's a defect, it's not happening, uh, let's, uh, let's put it on the, on the, on the uh, uh, overflow lot, and then we'll have to bring it back, take it apart, and figure out what the problem is, right? So that, that if you think about it, the, the feedback control is what they're using. Uh, the car didn't work, and it was built, and now they have to figure out what the problem is. Well, what Toyota was doing in the 80s is they were designing uh, machines that would test parts before the part would go in the car. So that would be an example of concurrent control. Uh, the transmission's already been tested. There's a machine that they created just to test the transmission. Now, some of you might think like, well, why would, didn't anybody do that? Well, it's cost, it's all about cost. Toyota famously always worried about the long-term cost, right? Uh, the reputation being tarnished by poor reliability, uh, hurting sales in the future, that's long-term cost. A lot of other companies worried about the short-term cost. We're not gonna test transmissions and build machines to test transmissions, that's going to cost a fortune. And I'm paying my, my employees to test the same thing twice. And then, of course, your feed forward control, your monitor performance inputs to minimize performance deficiencies before they occur. And so I have a couple examples for you guys, right? Your TA. So, uh, you know, Grace is your TA. He or she just sent this email here just before spring break, right? Here's the date. Uh, you know, I'm here to help you out. I want to go over your work. Let me help you. This is before you turn it in. That's feed forward. You have a former student who aced the class and who's your TA and was hired because she's exceptional who wants to help you. Are you taking advantage of that? That's feed forward. And uh, some of you uh, who bought the new version of the textbook, 
which is not a requirement at all, by the way, uh, you have a little card in there where you have access to the author's website, right? And you can actually, when you're done reading a chapter, uh, you can have a practice quiz before we take the quiz for this class. That would be another example of feed-forward control. All right, so now let's look at uh, when it works and when it doesn't. Maintaining control. Control isn't always worthwhile or possible. Control loss occurs when behavior and work proce procedures do not conform to uh, standards. Uh, to determine if control is worthwhile, managers have to assess regulation costs. Sometimes it's just too expensive. Uh, cybernetic feasibility. So here's our little chart again, and maybe one of those steps over here is just not possible, or you're having difficulty with one of those steps, so you can't, you know, uh, complete the wheel. Um, sometimes it's a return on investment, you know. Uh, I know this is a morbid topic, perhaps, but a friend of mine uh, is a consultant in healthcare and helps hospitals um, with quality. He's a PhD statistician. And so when hospitals go through accreditation, they have to analyze everything they've done and they have to test uh, their outcome against the rest of the, of the nation, perhaps. So, you know, earlier we talked about infections, right? Uh, hospital infection can lead to something called septicemia, which is uh, infection of the blood, and you can die from that. Well, some hospitals are worse than others with that, right? And so in terms, of, uh, in terms of cost, some hospitals make the cost benefit that, you know, it's going to cost us millions and millions and millions of dollars uh, maybe to uh, bring in some new equipment or bring in some uh, new ways of operating and it would save how many lives. And so that's when they bring in the actuaries and literally do a cost benefit. Um, let's see, control methods. Uh, so there's going to be five of these, right? Bureaucratic objects. So let's go through, through each of them. Let's start with bureaucratic control. Remember bureaucratic chapter one and two? Maybe you remember the German guy who came up with bureaucracy, right? So that already gives you an idea as to what kind of control that's going to be. Uh, so here, let's get, let's get rolling here with the use of hierarchical authority to influence employee behavior. For those of you who have ever seen Office Space, it's a classic uh, and so, um, you know, we'll, I'll show you that clip of, uh, of that example. It involves rewarding or punishing employees for compliance or non-compliance with rules, policies, procedures. The characteristics are emphasis on following rules and policies and higher resistance to change and slow response to competitors and customers. So here, enjoy the clip. Hello, Peter. What's happening? Uh, we have sort of a problem here. Yeah, you apparently didn't put one of the new cover sheets on your TPS reports. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I, I forgot. Mm, yeah. You see, we're putting the cover sheets on all TPS reports now before they go out. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. I just uh, forgot, but uh, it's... Not shipping out till tomorrow, so there's no problem. Yeah. If you could just go ahead and make sure you do that from now on, that would be great. And uh, I'll go ahead and make sure you get another copy of that memo. Okay? Yeah, no, I, 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 I have the memo. I've got it. It's right. Hello, Phil. What's happening? Um, What's happening? We need to talk about your TPS reports. Yeah, the cover sheet, I know. I know. Uh, Bill talked to me about it. Yeah. Did you get that memo? Yeah, I got the memo. And I understand the policy, and the problem is just that I forgot the one time, and I've already taken care of it, so it's not even really a problem anymore. Ah, yeah. It's just we're putting new cover sheets on all the TPS reports before they go out now, so if you could go ahead and try to remember to do that from now on, that'd be great. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. It's a classic. Um, all right, objective control. Number two, use of observable measures of uh, worker behavior or output to assess performance and influence behavior. So different types here. You've got the behavioral and the output control. Behavioral, regulation of behaviors and action that worker perform and the output, regulation of workers result via rewards and incentives. I use the example of uh, Zappos in this case. Um, employees at Zappos can um, nominate every month, by the way, 
another employee. It cannot be a manager or team leader or something like that. And uh, and they can get up to 50 bucks and they call them Zollers, but they're real dollars. Uh, but, you know, again, it's to uh, usually uh, they can nominate people who's, who have exhibited one of the main tenets of uh, the Zappos philosophy. So that would be an example of behavioral control that's an objective control. And then let's get into normative uh, control, uh, regulation of workers' behavior and decision through widely shared organizational values and beliefs. So it's created in two ways, hiring based on attitudes and values and managers and employees learning about what should and shouldn't be done by observing and listening to stories recited by experienced personnel. Again, I use Zappos um, for this as well. They, they, they have some really interesting, fun way of making sure people have the right value when they recruit them. And something as innocent as you getting a ride uh, from the shuttle uh, at the airport, right? So you have a job interview uh, in Vegas with Zappos and they're gonna pick you up at the airport. And uh, what you're not realizing if you're not careful is that that car ride on the way to headquarters is an interview. And that person is a driver, but that driver gets to let them know uh, how, how you were. Were you nice to them? Did you talk? Did you ignore them? Did you ask questions? And that, that actually is part of your interview. Uh, very, very famously, they, they, have, they, they always say they will turn down someone with um, all of the right credentials. Maybe they went to an Ivy League school and they're just amazing on paper. If they're not the right fit, if they're not, you know, the idea is if we wouldn't want to hang out with them after work, uh, then they're not going to make the job. Uh, if they have passion, if they're falling off the edge of their seat with passion, uh, that's a plus. Even if they lack some of the experience, uh, some of the knowledge, that can be taught. What can never be taught is passion. All right, so that's for normative control. Uh, and then we're getting into conservative control. This one is really interesting. So it's a, it's a little bit extreme, right? Regulation of workers' behavior and decisions through work group values and beliefs. So now we're talking about way, way out there, right? Um, arises when firms assign work group complete autonomy and responsibility for task completion. Uh, it can lead to more stress for workers to conform to expectations than bureaucratic control. Uh, this is an example from your author, really fascinating. You should totally look it up. Uh, it's called The Other Side Movers, and I'll show you a little clip here. Hopefully it works. A council of pe people, then The Other Side Academy, there's four of us that are um, in charge to make collective decisions based on an individual. And the reason we do it that way is because um, I might... I might have an affection for you that might blind me as to some of your bad behaviors and the other people are more objective about you and so or I might just really dislike you I might just really not have any patience for you so I might treat you unfairly if it was left only to me nobody's perfect especially in this environment so when you have a council of people then you're collectively going to make better and more fair decisions about any particular individual because a lot of us are very difficult especially when we're new because it's so hard to adjust and and you got to be as empathetic for the complete knuckleheads as you are for the people that come in and and fall right in line and do everything right uh, again fascinating company I um, it's a nonprofit organization called the other side movers based in Utah and it's uh, exclusively uh, ex-prison uh, convicts. Uh, and uh, it's the way that this company has uh, really grown and what it is today is, is phenomenal. Uh, I encourage you to, again, research it. Um, and conservative control has worked out really well for them. Uh, then, then now the most extreme of all of the extreme examples is the self-control or self-management. Again, I'm, I'm using Zappos because uh, they apply so well to this, right? So remember that uh, Tony Shea um, created this holacracy at Zappos, right? And so it, it used to be top-down. Uh, he was the CEO, you have the board, etc. And several years ago, he, he basically said, we're, we're, we're not doing this top-down thing anymore. We're creating this holacracy. And so this slide, what it does, it kind of shows you at Zappos 
how that worked out, uh, you know, in terms of the holacracy. Everything is kind of these circles. That's how it's done, right? Uh, it takes power traditionally reserved for executives and managers and spreads them across all employees. So you have a super circle, sub circle, and then you get the role. And so all of that stuff is kind of explained. Uh, you don't have a manager, you have a, a lead link, right? Um, and now they have twice as many lead link roles as they did managers. Um, again, there's a lot of controversy about that. Um, jury's still out in a lot of areas. It looks like maybe it might, it, it, it has worked for Zappos based on their uh, goals uh, and their revenue. Uh, and so again, self-control or self-management, um, same thing. Uh, Zappos calls it holacracy, but that's what it is, self-management. Managers and workers control their behavior by setting their own goals, monitor their own progress, reward or punish themselves for uh, not achieving uh, or for, uh, sorry, reward for achieving or punish themselves for not achieving their self-set goals. Uh, it, when you read this in the textbook, you will see uh, this whole idea of uh, even carrying these cards around so you can like uh, pull out the card based on uh, the reward uh, or outcome. All right, uh, now that we've done with all five, uh, how do we manage all this? How do we, uh, we talked about benchmarking, we talked about, um, you know, uh, defend, uh, different levels of benchmarking. So this is an example here now from Barclay, right? And it's the manage scorecard. It's a measurement of organizational performance in different areas, right? So you have the financial area over here, customer, internal operations, innovation, and learning. And that's, by the way, going to be the, the, the rest of the chapter, what we're going to do now, except for financial. I'm not going over financial. I saved that for you. And the reason is uh, for, for this to happen, uh, you would I would have wanted you to take finance uh, and accounting. And um, I you're going to learn the stuff in accounting, so I usually don't bother you. Uh, with calculating ratios at this level. Uh, so, you know, again, what's really important for you to understand here is that imagine your budget as an organization as a pie, right? You have X amount of money. That's your budget. That's a pie. And these four things, you want to take care of all of them, but some of them are going to require more than others, right? You can't make the pie bigger. The pie is only a certain size. So you're going to have to decide how you're going to allocate uh, your budget for each of these areas, right? And so this is for Barclay Bank, for example, the financial, the company, customer, customers and clients, internal, that here this is for, uh, uh, let's see, colleague and conduct and learning and citizenship, right? They have their objective over here. And on this side, they have the measure, they have the targets, very explicit, and what the initiatives are, right? Now, having said that, um, maybe they're really strong. Barclay Banks is well known uh, financially, right? Very strong. And look at their target, right? 10.5 for capital requirement and 5% ROE. Um, now, how do you make all that work together with your budget? How do you do it? So that's the next slide. We're going to look at the you know advantages of balanced scorecard. And I, I took some liberties here where I went, again, a little bit above and beyond. Look at these three pictures. Bowling, an orchestra, and business, right? And we're going to see kind of how these three things differ from each other in terms of what's called optimization. So uh, balanced scorecard forces managers to set specific goals and measure performance in these four areas we just discussed. It minimizes the chance for sub-optimization. I, I, before we get into a lot of sub-optimization, I'm going to, on the next slide, uh, explain optimization uh, where we're going to learn it from, from the master, that's Dr. Deming. So first, let's see what the author tells us here for sub-optimization. Improved performance in one part of an organization at the expense of decreased performance in another part. If we go back to the previous slide here, remember, that's why I emphasize this whole pie, right? And maybe if I want to put more of the pie, the piece of pie in one area, it means I got to cut in an other area. And I'm not going to get the best in each area. Maybe 
one area will be superb, two areas are going to be good, one area is not so good. That would be sub-optimization, right? So now let's look at optimization uh, and directly from Dr. Deming. Now keep in mind, uh, Dr. Deming, by the time we really kind of in the U.S., figured out who he was and learned about how important he had been, uh, he was in his 90s. And so I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of caveat because um, it's not always easy to understand him. Uh, I'll put the closed captioning here for you. Um, but remember, this is the father of modern management as we know it. Everything we know today about uh, quality management, father of quality management, everything we know today about that comes from Deming. If you're learning about Six Sigma, uh, Kaizen, any of that stuff, the heart of it is total quality management and it's Deming. Uh, General Electric, every time they make a jet engine, they use Deming's methodology still today. All right. Now, what is a system? It is a series of functions or activities, call them sub processes or stages, could be mechanical or electrical parts put together to work together within an organization or within an automobile that work together for the aim of the organization. The component sub-processes are necessary but not sufficient of themselves to accomplish the aim of the system. Management of a system therefore requires knowledge of the interrelationships between all the sub-processes within the system and of everybody that works in it. By understanding a system, one may be able to trace the consequences of a proposed change. The degree of interdependence between component processes may vary from one system to another. For example, in a uh, bowling team, each one plays his own solos. On the other hand, in an orchestra, it's all interdependence. They work together as a system. I'd say that the degree of interdependence is probably greater in business than it is in an orchestra. The greater the interdependence between sub-processes, the greater be the need for communication and cooperation. Management's job is to optimize the system. A good example of a system well optimized is a good orchestra. The players are not there to play solos as prima donnas, to catch the ear of the listener. They're there to support each other. They're usually not the best players in the country. What's the difference between two orchestras? Same music. Not a mistake. Everything's done just right. Listen to the difference. It's the way they work together. Working together is as critical in a system as it is in an orchestra, and management has to understand that. Because if you are concentrating on improvement of one area, you may very well be making other areas worse. It is what Dr. Deming calls optimization. Suboptimization, that is, the failure to optimize the system, is costly. It would be poor management, for example, to optimize sales, anything to sell, or to optimize manufacturers, spend all their energy into manufacturing. This would be the suboptimization causing loss. All these activities should be coordinated to optimize the whole system. Hopefully uh, you understand why I wanted to show you this. Um, it's unfortunate that um, the author didn't go into, um, you know, giving, it's unfortunate the author did not give a lot of credit here to, to Dr. Deming. This is really uh, one of the many things he was uh, well known for. Uh, all right, controlling customer defection. So here's my colleague and friend, Carol Dickerson. She loves coffee. There's her Starbucks right here. And we're going to look at controlling customer defection. I made this so easy in this case. Let's say we're going to calculate Carol drinking uh, one cup of coffee five days a week. That's a $5 cup. 
and we're going to multiply by 30 years, Carol's value as a Starbucks customer only in 30 years is $39,000, right? So when you when you calculate the lifetime value of a customer, you you really are, you know, if you want to try to truly explain to your employees why it's important to have outstanding customer service, and if somebody looks like they're not finding something, you should be proactive and help them and don't just ignore them because that's what's walking away. It's not someone who just, you know, didn't buy a pair of jeans today. It's someone times how many weeks, how many months, how many years they would come back and then bring their friends, etc. So you, it, it's, it's imperative uh, in that measure of your benchmark to control customer defection. The performance assessment in which companies identify which customers are likely to leave, uh, measure the rate at which customers are leaving is more accurate than satisfaction survey. Uh, 96% of unhappy customers never complain directly to the company. Think about that for a second. And that's why I was telling you earlier, if somebody's giving you feedback, they're doing you a favor. Um, uh, I want you to think about this. Um, this is kind of an interesting little factoid. Um, what is the most uh, driven car that former, uh, sorry, that uh, new, we call them defectors, right? So a defector is someone who goes from one brand to uh, another brand. What is the what is the previous car most driven by Tesla defectors? Think about that one for a second. What car did they have before they bought a Tesla? Of all cars. So if you think about the company I'm asking you to guess, that's the company that has the highest customer defection loss to this competitor, Tesla. In this case, you might be surprised, it is Toyota Prius. More customers go from Toyota Prius to Tesla than any other brand. Um, and so it's it, th this also will explain why sometime, I believe next year, uh, Toyota is going to finally release an electric car. Toyota has not sold an electric car. They've had electric hybrids, uh, for example, the Prime, but they haven't, they, they've really uh, refused uh, to, to do that. So again, understanding your customer defections and making sure that you keep all of your customers happy. Be proactive. Um, so let's see, controlling customer defection continued advantages. There's an impact on retention and profit. There's a higher likelihood of uh, receiving honest feedback when you're proactive uh, and when you control those defections. Ability to determine who will leave and prevent it from happening. Uh, maybe you can establish that there is going to be a profile of a customer uh, that is used to a certain thing, and then you can uh, control that and reach out to them and be proactive. Um, all right, now what are the advantages and disadvantages of different measures of quality? Before I go to that slide, I want you to go back to what I mentioned earlier about uh, even, uh, even the hospitals, right? Remember we talked about how... Um, some of these hospitals have, uh, you know, kind of said like, we are going to be very happy within a certain level of quality and we're not going to go beyond that, right? Uh, so in this case, I'm going to use cars. So first, let's focus on the quality measures, right? There's really three different ways of looking at this. There's one that's just going to be excellence. That's the example I'm using here for Mercedes-Benz. I mean, look at their slogan, seriously, the best or nothing. Wow, right? The best or nothing. Ironically, the latest survey from Consumer Reports, which is a nonprofit organization, I use Consumer Reports. I don't bother with JD Powers. JD Powers is a for-profit. Uh, they make money by every time they sell an ad showing which truck got JD Powers or something. Uh, Consumer Reports magazine is uh, the only publication of the Consumers Union, which is a nonprofit. They don't. They only take donations. Uh, from people, uh, they uh, don't advertise anything except for their own magazine. So it's the most objective measure. And if you look at Mercedes-Benz this year, this is brand new, just came out. Uh, they rank uh, over here, uh, uh, they basically get a C is what they're getting. Um, and so not, not so good, I'm sorry, that's not even a C. What is that, a 40, right? That's an F, they got an F. The highest grade, by the way, is a is a what I'm sorry my glasses here is Mazda is number one this year which is really surprising it's always been Toyota and Lexus Mazda went up by a lot uh, but if you look over here at uh, the uh, reliability 
uh, that green dot is the only one that's the highest level of predicted reliability. So they've Mazda is doing something really exceptional with their cars lately. Um, and then um, you know you could still rank number two. Look at BMW and have just average reliability. Subaru's average, Porsche's average, and then we go back to. Uh, I cannot see what company that is because I don't have my right glasses on. But anyway, you get the idea. Lexus, Toyota, uh, that's what's going to happen here. And you get, you know, the idea all the way down. Um, Fiat used to be at the bottom, but I believe that uh, we don't sell Fiats in the U.S. anymore, so they're no longer on the list. All right, so that's for excellence, right? Uh, promotes clear vision, uh, being uh, the best, motivates, inspires, managers, and but... but Excellence is ambiguous. I mean, the best. Obviously, you're not the best at reliability, Mercedes-Benz. Uh, provides a little practical guidance for managers. You know, it's kind of... In advertising, there's a term called puffery, which is, um, you know, exaggeration. And, well, there you go. Value appeals to customer who know excellence when they see it. Customer recognize the difference in value. Easier to measure and compare whether the product service is different. So this is perhaps... Uh, going to be more of a Toyota thing, right? That's going to be value, right? Uh, sometimes the appeal is difficult to measure, can be difficult to determine what factors influence whether the product is seen as having value. Um, you know, remember the sticky pedals with Toyota and all of a sudden people were, you know, some people were having crashes and stuff, right? Well, if my value of a Toyota product is reliability historically and now they're having defects, what's left, right? So that can be a problem. And then at the very bottom, the very basic is, look, we're, we conform to specs. That's it. This is it. We, we know we, uh, we're telling you this thing is going to work just because it works. You buy it, you turn it on, and it works. That's it. Um, and so um, in this case, it's the very basic, uh, and it's all about standardization. Uh, some products cannot be easily uh, evaluated. It can promote standardization, may hurt performance when adapting to change is more important and maybe less appropriate for service, which are dependent on a high level of uh, human contact. So again, you get the idea. Um, innovation and learning perspective, the last tenet over here. I know we talked about innovation before, so I'm gonna keep this one pretty straightforward. So continuous improvement in ongoing service and product uh, is involved in innovation. Uh, relearning and redesigning creation process you uh, have to maintain sub uh, sustainability. Again, uh, this is where your author on uh, page 369, uh, we're breaking these into different areas, right? Uh, good housekeeping, material product substitution, process modification. Uh, and uh, it's you know all about waste disposal, waste treatment, recycle and reuse, and waste prevention and reduction. So that's going to be uh, the, the, the last tenet for sustainability there. Uh, and that's it for us. Uh, I uh, Well, we're just under an hour this time, as uh, I hope you got a lot out of it. And I'll see you on the next one.